since uh, 1991, the annual 16 Days campaign has mobilized more than 3,700 organizations in 164 countries to raise awareness about the pervasiveness of the multiple forms of violence women face. From Afghanistan to Iceland, the 16 Days campaign has grown into a powerful platform to educate the public and governments about violence against women and human rights. This year, as Mary has mentioned, the theme is militarism. But what do we mean by that? For the 16 Days campaign, there's been a particular attention paid to different forms of militarism. And for this campaign, the focus is primarily on the ideologies that create a culture of fear and that support the use of violence, aggression, or military interventions for settling disputes and enforcing economic or political interests. So this form of militarism is not in keeping with the more recently developed concept of human security. This is the old-fashioned aggressive militarism that actually works very strongly against building a culture of peace. It's important when we're understanding militarism to appreciate that militarism also privileges certain violent forms of masculinity. And I note with appreciation the number of men that are with us tonight, and I trust and know that you won't take this personally, <laughs> that this is about wider trends that are worldwide. This kind of masculinity has grave consequences for women and children, for their safety and their security, and also for men who don't conform to a particular definition of what it is to be masculine or to be a real man. And when we see these manifestations of militarism, we can see just by watching the news or reading any paper how this kind of militarism dominates current world events. That includes military interventions, long before all the range of possible peace-building strategies have been actually applied and attempted. Women-focused murder campaigns that we've seen in our own country. Attacks on civilians participating in political change. And ways of using militarism to justify and perpetuate conflict, not to take the position that everything possible has to be done by the state and by civil society to find more peaceful means. This year, the 16 Days Campaign has focused on five themes, and these themes really develop the intersectionality of violence against women and some of the strategic responses that we see in civil society government and UN agencies to try and counteract the, it, the, really the epidemic of violence against women in our world. The first of these themes is looking at the international tools and mechanisms that help us as members of civil society hold our governments accountable for protecting and respecting rights. Some examples, and Manitoba is home to a unique organization in Canada called UNPAC that grew out of the Beijing Platform for Action, which as many in this room know, is not technically in and of itself a human rights treaty. It's a high-level policy that was derived out of the 1995 World Conference on Women in Beijing, but it has proven to be a platform from which governments and agencies and civil society groups have been able to actually bring about changes because it's very, it's very accessible. It not only has the overall theme of a platform for action, but it sets larger goals and then inside those goals it has targets and activities, strategies in order to realize. Much of the platform for action is unrealized and much of it is still in process. And what is unique about Manitoba's UNPAC 
is that this is a women's organization that was built with leadership from Muriel Smith and others who came out of Beijing. Were you part of that also, Mary? Mm -hmm. Probably, I would think so. And that it's, the leadership has passed now to the next generation of leadership. This is a non-profit, non-governmental organization that continues to look at the issues in terms of those goals that were set coming out of the World Conference. In addition, we do have the major UN treaty that is dedicated exclusively to women, and that's the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And complementing that, we have more general but useful references in our international humanitarian law that pertains particularly to times of conflict and how, how services and interventions occur consistent with international law standards. And then we have the Security Council and a whole series of resolutions that broke new ground in 2000 when Resolution 1325, 1325, was passed by the Security Council. What made this groundbreaking was actually two important features of this Security Council resolution. First, much of the drafting that went into 1325 was actually done at the grassroots internationally by women's organizations who articulated the reality that they saw in post-conflict and conflict situations, and that addresses the fact, and still a very, very serious problem uh, this many years, 11 years later, is the lack of engagement when governments and international agencies, such as the United Nations, actually start to try to help a government recover and a state to rebuild after internal violence, and that women get excluded. So, for example, in Liberia, which currently has Africa's only woman, elected woman president, the women, which was the case in Ireland, which was the case in Burundi, you can go through country after country and you see that it's the grassroots movement for peace by women that actually trigger the shift towards peace agreements. But when the peace agreements get negotiated, very seldom have women, any women, been at the table for those peace agreements. So what do they leave out? They leave out women's reality. What do many of those peace agreements do? Well, in the words of, of one U.S. diplomat, they have men with guns forgiving other men with guns for using violence against women. That's often what you see in peace agreements. So this series of resolutions that have come from 1325 and 2000 and have had sequential refining by subsequent Security Council resolutions have most recently been joined by U a UN Security Council Resolution 1960. These are considered the suite of Security Council resolutions that focus on women, peace and security. Now, what we go to the United Nations as part of the Global College offering, and we were there in October of 2010, last year, during the open debate of the Security Council on Women, Peace and Security. And it's out of those open debates that much of these Security Council resolutions have taken place. The second really important feature of 1325 and the subsequent resolutions is that never before 1325 had the Security Council ever made a decision that women's security, women's peace and security was serious enough, important enough to actually be the subject of a Security Council resolution. So that also was a very significant turning point. These tools and mechanisms are the entry points these are the ways in which social movements, and I would count those of us here tonight as part of a social movement for peace, to reframe the whole concept of security. So that the emphasis is on human security, not on one military fighting or confronting another military. 
And that shifts the whole definition to one that's based fundamentally on human rights.